thank you very much, Joe, for that uh, kind introduction. Um, uh, if the sound is on, and you listen very carefully, there we go. You can hear the sound of a dripping tap. Doesn't mean that the here on level three below floor ground we've got a leak. Uh, what it means is uh, it's the sound of a dripping tap. And we're very used to the image of a dripping tap, which is, uh, oops, sorry. There we go. Uh, image of a dripping tap is shown by this drop of milk going into a cup of coffee. It forms a crown, a crater, and then a jet lifts and pretty much takes out of the coffee the same milk that went in so that you can uh, be very cool, uh, physicists, engineers, scientists, when you go to a cocktail party and somebody says, would you like your coffee black or white? And you can say white, and as that first drop comes out again, you can catch it and say black. Uh, there are very few opportunities for, for us to do that. Um, right, now all that beautiful stuff you've just seen on the video has nothing to do with the sound you heard. Two are completely disconnected. And I can show that from this experiment. This is a drop of water falling through air. Uh, this is the air. And this is the line between the water and the air. This is the water. Under, underneath it, the water here we have a hydrophone and an underwater microphone. This is the time series coming out of the, um, out of the hydrophone. And as I play the movie, a little red line will track across, or a blue line, it looks like it, will track across the screen and to keep the two in synchrony. So you'll be able to see what it is that causes this big thing, the plink of a dripping tap. So here we go, the drop falls, and it forms this crater. And there's been nothing, just a little bit of hydrodynamic pressure perturbations. But in about five seconds, you'll see what causes the blink. And watch the bottom of this crater, there, that little bubble formed all that plink noise. And the reason is because bubbles are extraordinarily powerful acoustically. They're good at generating sound, and they do extraordinary things when you drive them with sound. And they're like little bells and gongs. A big bubble produces a low note, a plink, and a small bubble, a high note, um, a small bubble produces a high note, like a little, like a little bell. And so by listening when, uh, to an event like a waterfall or a scuba driver breathing out or an ocean wave breaking, it's as if uh, when all those bubbles are formed, each one is a member of a choir and they've got one note to sing. And that note indicates how large they are. So you hear the crash of a breaking wave and you should be able to count how many bubbles were produced and, 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 and what size they were. And every plink followed by a silence like this will increase the bubble count by one. Now, we've built sensors. Uh, the summer going on to the North Sea, uh, bottom of the North Sea uh, next year to, to listen for gas leaks from pipelines and carbon capture and storage reservoirs. But when you get many, many bubbles coming up from the seabed like this, you don't get a clear signal, plink, followed by silence, because they all overlap. You get something like this. So it's very hard to see those individual bubble signatures and know the bubble size. But what you can do is put that information into a computer. We've given the computer all the equations for how the bubbles make this, and they can invert that sound and tell us the, the, the population. Um, there's a lot of equations, they're all like this. Um, but you don't need to go through the derivation because you've got them in your head. Because if I play this sound, you'll tell me there were lots of little bubbles produced and one big bubble at the end. You hear that? So there's no need to go through the derivation of the equations. You have that already in your head. So we can, we can listen to the sound of a breaking wave or a gas leak and find out how many bubbles there are and what size they are. And that's great. We've produced sensors for the sea, for the oil industry, and that's a lot of fun. However, those equations work equally well, whether it's Earth's, oceans, or whether it's another planet. This is uh, Saturn, and here is Saturn's moon, Titan. Now. For many, 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 many years, NASA's modus operandi for getting money is to say, we want a mission to somewhere. Uh, we expect to discover life there, or the signs of life. And 10 years later, there's no sign of life, but they say, look at the pretty pictures. Pretty pictures, pretty pictures. Fund us again, pretty pictures. That's what they do. Never, ever have we listened to the sound of another world. We don't know what another world sounds like. And if you go to the movies and you see wonderful images made up of other planets, the sounds that they produce are just classical music or made up sounds. We, we have no sounds from another world, but we have the equations that will enable us to predict the sounds on Earth. 
So we can take the same equations, put in different parameters for another world, and get the sounds of another world. So this is Titan. Uh, it's an extraordinarily interesting world. It's got a thick atmosphere. You can see that from this purple haze around it. It's an atmosphere that's very smoggy. It's full of smog. Uh, and because it was full of smog, we'd never seen what was at the surface. Um, the surface is cold, minus 180 degrees Celsius. And some of us thought that there would be, under this smog-covered atmosphere, the equivalent of a water cycle with rain, rivers, lakes, um, but not made of water, made of liquid ethane and methane. And uh, the Huygens probe, which looks like a large wok, uh, was sent to, uh, on a seven-year journey to uh, Titan on the probe Cassini, which the Americans launched. And it, Huygens parachuted through the atmosphere. And at the time, all those probes were crashing into Mars and getting lost. And, and one thing I was saying is, look, a camera is quite fragile. A spectrometer is quite fragile. A microphone is not that fragile. If we would equip our probes with microphones, then yes, if everything works, we could listen to the sound of another world, the lightning, the rock falls, and the such like. But if that probe crashes into the planet, and the last thing we hear is a splash instead of a crunch, we've discovered the first lake open to the atmosphere anywhere in this universe other than our planet. So. Um, that presupposes, though, that you would recognize, your brain would process, using those same equations, would process the splash on a lake of liquid ethane and methane at 180 degrees below zero. You'd process that as a splash, not a thlup or a blup or something else. So, um, so well, let's use those equations to predict what that sound would, 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 would sound like. So uh, the BBC did an animation here of before Huygens landed, of uh, it parachute. There's, there's Huygens, there's the parachute, parachuting down through the atmosphere towards a lake, if it were to hit a lake. And we calculated what the sound would be uh, and put it to this to see whether it sounded like a recognizable splash. <laughs> Perfectly recognizable, so that was good. So had there been a useful microphone on Huygens, there was a microphone, but it wasn't really useful for that purpose. Uh, we could have heard a splash had it hit a splash. In fact, what it landed on is this terrible snowy plain, uh, um, mud, snow, ice, and the camera just sat there looking for two hours out at this view, and it would have been a, such a catastrophe had there been behind it a waterfall made of liquid ethane and methane, and we didn't know it was there. Now, a microphone would have heard it, but this thing didn't, just sat there for two hours. As it happened, it, later studies did show that there were lakes and such like, and we think Huygens landed not really far from one. Um, what would that, mic what would we question, what would that waterfall have sounded like? Would we recognize it had it been behind us? <laughs> Yeah, it would have been. As it happens, I think there's probably only waterfalls in the rainy season, but uh, so to speak. Right, now most of the bubbles, in fact, the vast number of bubbles on Earth uh, are produced by breaking waves like this. Um, this is an image that I took. Uh, it's through the sea surface. You can see a little bit of wave breaking activity on the surface, but underneath you have these enormous clouds of bubbles. Um, containing billions of bubbles, and this is really how the world breathes. We have an awful lot of atmospheric carbon. It's produced by um, uh, anthropogenic sources, man-made sources, and then a lot of it dissolves into the ocean through the action of waves breaking, trapping bubbles, and then the hydrostatic pressure and the surface tension uh, causing them to uh, dissolve. Some bubbles will dissolve, and some will rise to the top again. So if you could measure these bubbles, you could tell something about the carbon budget of the planet. You could find where this missing carbon is, because there's a lot. There's at least 1,000 billion tons of atmospheric carbon a year transfers into the oceans and out again. And it's very important when that happens, and what because the, the ocean turns up to be a large uh, store of atmospheric carbon. If it were all to come out at once, it would create something of a problem. So we designed an experiment. So you take a wave that it breaks traps a load of atmospheric gas in the form of bubbles, 
And at the moment they're formed, the bubbles send out plinks, and we can count them. We know the size of the bubbles and the number of bubbles. But that doesn't tell us how much atmospheric carbon is dissolving into the ocean, because some dissolves and some rises out back to the atmosphere when the bubbles, um, when the bubbles uh, rise to the atmosphere. So a little time later, some bubbles have written to the surface to release their gas to the atmosphere, and some have been pushed down by turbulence. They tend to be the smaller ones, because buoyancy is stronger than large bubbles. So if we want to count how, how much carbon is dissolving into the atmosphere, we have to make two measurements. Once, when the bubbles are first put into the ocean by listening to the wave, and we have to count again some time later, short time later, when some of those bubbles have dissolved. And uh, the bubbles are silent at this time, but the way you can make them uh, come back and tell you how, uh, how many there are is to send sound at them. If I blindfold you and walk you into a room and I tell you that room might be full of bells or not, then one way you could do to find out is just to shout and listen to the bells if they ring back at you. So in the same way, we um, took a sonar source um, and we sent pings into the ocean to make these silent bubbles ring back to us to give us a second count of how many were there. So two researchers put a sound source underwater and sent sound at the bubbles, and that gave us our second count. So we know how much gas went in, how much was left after, and therefore we could tell how much has dissolved into the ocean. Um, again, you've got the equations in your head, so I'll play this little story and this little clip, and you should be able to tell that, that there's a difference between the reverberation in the ocean before and after the bubbles, the bubbles are formed. These are sonar pings in bubble-free water. And now the same pings after a wave has passed and generated bubbles. So um, we did that, and that labelled us to generate large models of ocean wave breaking. So this is an element of the ocean. It's about a footprint of about 100 metres by 100 metres in the horizontal, and then it goes to about 15 metres depth. These are uh, bubble clouds, and the bubbles are colour-coded. So the blue are the very small bubbles, and you expect them to go deep. And the red are the larger bubbles, and they would tend to hang up near the uh, top of the ocean. So as I run the model, uh, it will uh, tell us where the bubbles are going, how much is dissolving, but at the same time, it's ground truthed all the time against these measurements to check that it's a sensible model. And then from the model, we get how much um, carbon dissolves into the atmosphere. So I shall run the model. And there you can see the turbulence is pushing the bubbles deep. And if, you, if the color's very good, you can see the red tends to be at the top and the blue deeper. And over time, you'll see, in fact, the bubble clouds form these beautiful Y-shaped patterns. That's because of a, a process called Langmuir circulation uh, that's going on in the ocean. When the, wave, when, the, when the wind blows over it, you get kind of vortex forming. It's a bit like the end of uh, Die Hard 2, when the aeroplanes come in to land over the airport and, and, um, and put the snow. Watch, watch the film. It's good for many things, but particularly for those air aircraft landing at the end. So I can't leave you without actually showing you the experiment, because people do hard work to get these data. So here it is. Watch out! Bloody hell. Okay. Now, the real masters of generating bubbles in the ocean are humpback whales. So this is a phenomenon we've known about for, for years. It's called bubble netting. So what happens is one whale or a number uh, dive down deep, and they swim in a spiral, blowing bubbles from their blowhole, which is their nostrils, effectively. And they make this, this curtain of bubbles. And the prey, the little shrimp, the little fish, get trapped in this curtain of bubbles and cannot, um, cannot escape. And then the whales come down deep from below. They don't bother hunting an individual fish because they're vast. They're just like grazers. They come up from below with their mouths open, and they just swallow all, everything that's there. And then, because the salt water would kill them, they, they squash against their bristles uh, with their tongue, and they squash all the seawater out and swallow what's left. Um, that's what they do. Here's a nice picture of them doing it. Okay. 
So we've known about it for decades, but there's a problem with the issue, and that is fish swim through bubbly water. We know that. We know salmon jump up good old uh, waterfalls. We, we know fish don't have too much of a problem most of the time with bubbly water. So I wondered if there was an acoustics explanation. Um, and so uh, I thought the trick of this isn't these two whales. It's this one here. Because if this one were to send out sound at the right frequency, and it's not the frequency set that these large whales normally use, sends out sound at the right frequency, it would be trapped within this bubble net. Um, if, you take a, if you look at a section, this is a section of bubbly water here. Um, at the right frequencies, these bubbles will reduce the sound speed. So uh, if you send out a wavefront like this, and the top half is in the bubbly water and the bottom half isn't, and this is slowed down, this is the wavefront, it's, the top half is slowed down, so it bends in towards the bubbly layer. And then as it tries to leave the bubbly layer the other side, this is slow, this is fast, so it bends back in. So uh, I'm going to uh, show that graphically now, and at the same time I'll play the, 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 the after, after I've come up with this um, theory, I asked people if they had recordings of whales when they did that, and in fact, they sent me them, and indeed, they do use the frequency range that you, you, you would expect from this prediction. Um, uh, it's, it's not the kind of normal frequency range they do when they're making music for you to buy in relaxation third world stores. Right, so uh, I'm going to do the animation. The sound is loud, so just be careful in case it comes out too loud. Here we go. <laughs> So it's circumstantial ev evidence, but if it was a lower frequency range that they normally use, it would just leak out of the, out of the net, but it doesn't. So here's schematically what might happen. And um, if you actually take this net which is, and do an analysis here of the sound speed variation, and you have a whale sending its sound in, you can see that indeed some, some uh, rays uh, refract, others bounce. And they bounce in a beautiful manner so that the um, the angle of incidence decreases, which is a feature of a spiral. And so you always get a quiet region here, the quiet region where you would expect the prey to congregate because it isn't so unpleasantly noisy there. If they have swim bladders, these frequencies would resonate their swim bladders. And any gentleman over the age of 55 will know that that's an, you don't want your swim bladder resonated. So uh, um, all the prey would congregate there. And again, circumstantial evidence, this is where the whales come up through the quiet region. So it is circumstantial. No one's going to swim through these and prove me wrong, rather like the no one's going to fly to Huygens uh, to, to tighten very quickly and prove me wrong. Uh, but it's uh, career advice. Do things people can never disprove. Uh, and provided it makes a good story, um, you're safe. Right. That was whales. So that made a nice story for me. And if you go on whale watching tours now, they, they, they use this as a standard story. So it's, it's entered, the, without any proof at all, it's entered the, the, the common knowledge. Um, right. That made sense to me. This didn't. This is another BBC uh, documentary. And it was dolphins doing the same thing. Now, whereas the whales doing it made sense to me, the dolphins doing it made absolutely no sense. So immediately my brain started thinking, what the heck's going on here? Uh, I'll show you the video clip. They're being released by the dolphins, working together in teams. They use the bubbles to corral the sardines into ever tighter grooves. OK, that makes no sense to me, because the dolphins don't send out these little calls to scare or communicate. What they're doing is echolocating. They're sending out clicks. So they will say that that person is a fish, and they send out a sound click, and then it travels. At the time it takes to hit that person and come back to me will tell me the range, and through all the ability to get the direction, we know where it is. So that's great. The problem is the bubbles are far more powerful scatterers than the fish. So we say that person's a fish, the rest of you are bubbles. In blowing bubbles, the dolphin has just cluttered its vision with a load of tremendously powerful scatterers. So it's blinding its most powerful 
hunting tool at the moment when it needs it most, when it's hunting. So what's it doing? Now, um, you might say, well, dolphins have great sonar, so they'll, they'll fix it. Dolphins don't have great sonar. Dolphins have mediocre sonar. If you take a dolphin and you put it on a table and compare its power, bandwidth, all that stuff, compared to the best man-made sonar, the best man-made sonar wins hand down. Yet the best man-made sonar could not detect a fish in that kind of bubble cloud. So it would just be maddened by all the clutter. Couldn't find that through all the bubbles. Now, dolphins have mediocre sonar as a piece of equipment, but they have a fantastic sonar capability. And one of the reasons is they've had 10 million years of practice and selective breeding to get it right. And they've got a platform, they swim fast, and they can look at target from any angles, and they've got a big brain. So I was thinking, OK, if I was a dolphin and I was devising a pulse, what pulse would I devise to try and find fish in that set of bubbly, uh, that bubbly cloud? Try and find that one thing when everything else is a mass of clutter. That is um, a target. There's a target inside this uh, sonar, uh, this piece of water here. It's real data. And there's a, within two meters of the source, we've hung a great weightlifter's weight. It's not a subtle target. It's a great big piece of steel, that big. Can't see it because it's surrounded by bubbles. And for those of you that don't work in sonar imaging, this is not dissimilar to the way a baby scan would work, something like that. So, we've got to try and see that uh, target. So I devised a pulse that's something like this. The dolphin will emit a signal, which I'm uh, saying is that Greek letter there. And it sends out something, a click, and sometimes later, sends out an identical click that's, say, half the size. It doesn't have to be a click, could be a chirp, could be anything. Just so long as it repeats that signal a short time later at half the size, or a third of the size, it doesn't really matter. Because if that happens, then you can look at scatter from the fish and the scatter from the bubbles. Now, a fish is pretty much a linear scatterer. So the echo is going to be pretty much a reflection of the signal that sends in. That's the fish. But the bubble, this is the bubble when it's hit by sand. Can you see its, it's, it's surface is wobbling like that? It's a nonlinear scatterer. So it doesn't scatter the, um, so much the uh, linear scatterer. It scatters the square of the signal that hits it. A strong second order nonlinearity. So let's look. The dolphin sends out these two clicks. Click, 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 and then a click half the amplitude. And then it gets back the same echoes from the fish. Click, click, because the signal that went that it gets back from the fish is pretty much the signal it sent out. Now the dolphin takes twice the second echo and adds it to the first echo. You get two times a half because that's the second echo, plus one, the first echo is one plus one is two. So you see strong bubbles, strong signals from the bubbles, from the fish, sorry. However, you also see strong signals from the bubbles, because you get two times half squared, which is the second echo, plus one squared, which is the first echo, which is one and a half. So you still, you've slightly made the fish stronger, but to be honest, there's still billions of bubbles out there. So you haven't really helped. But now, without having to send out any new signals, you take the memories of those echoes and you subtract them. So it's the first echo minus twice the second echo. For the scatter from the fish, you get 1 minus 2 times a half, which is 1 minus 1 is 0. So the fish becomes invisible. Doesn't happen for the bubbles. 1 squared minus 2 times a half squared is a half. The bubbles don't go invisible. So if you do this, the thing that you're looking for, the fish, goes invisible. And the stuff that you're not interested in, the, the clutter, just stays. So let's say uh, here you have a, a field, and there's a fish in there. And now you start adding and subtracting your memories. And the fish flashes off and on. Easy to find. So nice theory of how dolphins know how to square, add, multiply, and subtract their echoes. Um, no proof whether it does or not, but we built a man-made sonar that does it, and you can see very easily the man-made sonar found the target. Same, this is exactly the same data, just processed differently. And if you listen to a dolphin click, everybody thought that, I don't know, listen to it. The amplitude goes up and down. It's not proof. It may be 
the way you would think when you heard that first time. The dolphins are being lazy and sloppy, or you didn't even notice it went up and down. Or maybe the dolphins are thinking like this, and they're adding, they appreciate the second order nonlinear linearity, and they're adding and subtracting their memories of the echoes. Maybe they're doing that. I don't know. But certainly it works with man-made sonar. So that's good, because we need a man-made sonar that can do that. Uh, so we built one. Here's one reason. This is the gulf. You can see around the, around the side of the gulf, there's a load of rubbish. It's uh, bubbles and mud. And in that bubbles and mud are a lot of mines hidden. They were thrown out by Saddam Hussein, and they're sitting there. And they're extremely hard to find. The uh, sonar doesn't work. Um, the American Navy used dolphins, who all died of infection, and, uh, man and divers using their fingers. And that was it. You've got divers with their fingers. And they find the mines, and therefore the place becomes safe for swimmers and children from the area to go swimming with. It's very unsatisfactory. So we developed a sonar that, that, will, that will find these mines. And the mine, finding mines is important. This is the Tripoli. It was one of the ships. Um, and it had uh, $3.6 million worth of damage to it and loss of life from a mine that you could buy on the internet for $1,500. And uh, which, which shows the, the problem with asymmetric warfare like this. So the ability to find these mines is very important because even if you only give the suspicion that there's a mine out there, it can delay everything. Delays the aid convoys, delays the military operations, delays the, uh, all the commerce that would try and get a, a place back on its feet again. So by clearing mines, you, you basically help a country grow and you make the beaches safe for swimming in. So that was good. Now, when I wrote the equations down for these, um, this sonar, I knew it didn't have to be sonar. These were just wave equations. It would work for any wave. You could apply it to an MRI scanner and use it to distinguish between uh, tumorous tissue and normal tissue, for example. Uh, one thing I wanted to do is, is do it for radar, because these these soldiers are doing pretty much what those dolphins are doing. They're trying to find a target in clutter. They're trying to find, find um, improvised explosive devices which um, are buried. And they're buried in ground that's filled with nails, Coke cans, bicycle parts, clutter. So if you try and use radar to detect metals or metal detectors, your chances of finding the IED go down if there's clutter, and they go down particularly as the enemy out there, the people who planted these, know you've got to get rid of the metal so they can build these things with a minimum amount of metal. So I knew that it was very important to try and um, find what little metal they have to include, which is this. It's the, it's the trigger. It's about two centimeters long. Now, if you can make the, a radar as powerful as the dolphin sonar uh, was, then you can find this trigger uh, and find the IEDs. So we built uh, the radar, and we buried it alongside uh, old bicycle clamps, uh, huge big sheets of metal, and mobile phones. And we buried them. And this is a map of uh, the scatter from them. It's a DB map. And you can see one of these targets is red. So it scatters 30 DB more than the rest. One of these targets is not like the other. And uh, this is after processing with the uh, you know, subtract and memories of the echoes thing of the radar signal. And sure enough, that's the trigger. And that's because I know I'm looking for a trigger, so I've tried to do that. I could equally make this find the mobile phones. And the nice thing, it's a passive. The mobile phone can have its battery taken out, have a car run over. It doesn't matter. It's a passive uh, system. Because if this building was to collapse, we're quite far below ground level. They'll never find you with radar because you're just bags of water. Uh, but you carry mobile phones. So if we can make your mobile phones 30 dB more powerful, more scatterers, than the bits of metallic structure that are around us, then we can find you and rescue you. OK. Um, right. Now I'll move on to the final stage of my talk. Um, this little bubble here has been sitting there wobbling away quite, quite happily. And I'm going to tell you how we used it for cold water cleaning. Um, so this is cleaning using cold water and no additives. Why did I want to do this? Well, there's lots of things you can't clean with hot water and soap, transplant organs, um, lettuce, uh, things like that. And sometimes all you have is cold water. If you're a mountain rescue climber and you climb to the top of a mountain, you'll be carrying a bottle of drinking water. 
and uh, it's cold water. You can rehydrate somebody with it, but it's useless for washing their wounds if they've got a bad graze that, that might turn infected. So I wanted to make cold water clean using bubbles like this. So you can generate surface waves on a bubble. Very clever with bubbles. You can see we're so clever, that's got a ripple around it. And when we turn the sound off and the ripple goes away, we got the logo of our university inside the bubble. Um, now, the way we generate the bubble, those um, uh, surface waves is we take a bubble, we hit it with sound. Sound is an oscillating pressure field. And because it goes low pressure, high pressure, the bubble pulsates. But then, after, if we hit it with the right sound field, after a couple of pulsations, there'll be a chaotic growth of instability on the wall. So you go into chaos for a bit, and then you'll come out of chaos and settle down in a, in a, in a regular structure. You'll see it happening here. So the bubble pulsates for a bit, and then there it goes. Now, if you have a bubble that's doing this, you have a scrubbing machine. If you're friendly with your neighbor, do that. And go next to them. You'll find you're tickling them a bit. This is a way of cleaning that is not chemical, but it's mechanical. And sometimes you need mechanical ways of cleaning. I'll show you later. Now, the other thing you notice about this bubble, it's not rising under buoyancy. That's because we can use the sound to steer the bubble where we want to go. And we can do it automatically. <clears throat> That's good, because it's easy to clean a flat surface like this. But if it has a crevice in, or a crack, or a join, you can't get in that crack where the dirt will be. You can't wipe there. You can't brush there. But I can make the acoustic field bounce around in that crack automatically in a way as to draw the bubbles in. It's called a radiation Birkness force. And that will draw the bubbles into the crack. So the bubbles will automatically, in a sound field, seek out the cracks and clean in them. Uh, show that here. This is a piece of plastic. In the plastic, we've got a, a pore that's uh, about 200 microns deep and maybe 50 microns wide. And on the top of the pore, we've got a very sticky contaminant here. And it also fills the pore. But it doesn't look black because you're only looking through 50 microns of it. <clears throat> in the bottom of the pore, we have a sensor here uh, that we've built that tells if the pore is clean. You can see at the moment it's, it's dirty. And then after time, it's going to go clean as we get the bubbles to clean it. So clean, dirty, time going ahead like this. So I shall run the movie, and the line will track in time with the video. And the first thing you do is see the top surface be cleaned. Then you'll see the bubbles find the pore automatically. And as they go into the pore, they'll be wriggling if you look carefully. And when they reach the bottom of the pore, this sensor will go from dirty to clean. Here we go. There's the bubbles. And they're wiggling. And when they reach the bottom, it's clean. And again, uh, some, I did this for the Institute of Physics, and they said, is, is there any maths behind this? So I kind of said, yeah, there is. Oh, there you go, and just show some. Just So it's not just a guy sending sound down water. There's a lot of maths behind it. Right, so here's a built into a device called Starstream, using a small company called Ultrawave. And this is a handheld nozzle. Water comes out the end, and it cleans. This is how it works. Uh, this is a, whoops, go, no, go back, go back. Here we go. This is an animation showing how it works. So water comes up this tube into the horn. This is a sound source on the back of the horn. It sends out sound waves. They travel down the water column, and uh, you've got um, bubbles generated here. They go into the surface and clean. And for those of you who love acoustics, you can probably understand it's very hard to get sound down a column of water. It's easy to get sound down a Victorian speaking tube because it's got hard walls and a gassy middle. You can speak down a tube easily, like they do on ships and old ships, things like that. It's very hard if the column is more dense than the walls because um, if I'm inside the if I'm inside the water, if I'm inside a gas column surrounded by solid walls, it's very easy to make pressure. If I had an egg in my hand, I'd squash it. But if I'm inside a column of water and the walls are movable, they're soft because there's air on the other side, it's very hard to make pressure. If I had an egg there, I wouldn't smash it doing that. So it's quite clever acoustics to try and get sand down a stream of water, but it works. Here's an example of it working. Uh, it's, uh, old st uh, it's old stonework with soot on, 
And there's just cold water coming out of here. And if five, four, three, two, one, I'm going to turn on the sound and the bubbles. And it cleans. So that works well. And it's a mechanical cleaner, and that's important. This is uh, bone graft. So when they do transplants for bone, um, they want the white bony stuff. They don't want the soft, squishy stuff. Because if that transplants from one person to another, you get an immune response reaction. It's very bad. So the way they clean it is uh, they take bone like this. That's before washing. And they soak for a week in hydrogen peroxide. So it's a powerful chemical attack for a problem that is really about mechanical cleaning. Because you can see that this is just full of pores. And you really want to clean in those pores, which is what bubbles do. If you soak for 20 minutes in hydrogen peroxide, you get no effect. If you take my device with just cold water, no chemicals added, after 20 minutes, it's cleaned the bone out as much as 20, uh, one week of hydrogen peroxide. And yet, it's safe to do on hands, transplant organs, things like that. This is, uh, these are three types of dental bacteria, uh, Staphylococcus mutants and such like. And they're put on bits, coupons that have um, structures, castellations. So you can see here's the top, and here's the bottom. And this is before cleaning, normal cleaning with water. It hasn't affected this. It's kind of cleaned the top of this, hasn't touched the bottom of this, hasn't touched this much. And with cold cleaning, with cold water, with Starstream, it cleans, cleans it all out. Just cold water. And here's the teeth. So this is teeth, where the bacteria stained purple uh, before. Cleaning with water, cleaning with my device. So it's nice. This is stainless steel, um, surgical steel. We're very interested in cleaning with surgical steel because um, you don't want somebody else's matter going into you. And so we have really good surgical, surgical uh, sterile services departments around the country. And uh, they clean surgical instruments after use. Um, but they're not 100% accurate. They don't always clean them perfectly. And in these times of austerity, if we start closing these things at the weekends to save on the overtime, you'll end up having your surgical... If you go for operation on a Monday, you'll have had the surgical instruments from Friday not washed. It's a bit like doing the, leaving your Friday evening washing up in the kitchen till Monday and hoping it'll be just as easy to clean. Um, it won't work. So we're very interested in getting stuff clean, particularly this is mouse brain. We're interested in mouse brain because of uh, CJD. We don't want that transmitted between surgical instruments. So this is mouse brain dried for 24 hours, um, like it would on a Friday night. And when you try and clean it with water flow for five seconds, it doesn't get rid of it. Take a second coupon, water, so water flow for five seconds, it's cleaned it. And we've just uh, been told that there's a program now to roll this out um, in uh, test hospitals across the UK so that hopefully surgical instruments will be more clean when people use them. I mentioned lettuce. You can't wash lettuce in really hot soapy water. So this is lettuce. Oh, it's basil, sorry. So this is a piece of basil. It's um, straight from the bag. So this has been bought from a supermarket ready to eat. This has been washed by all the ways the supermarket can wash it. And if you look under a microscope, it's got bacteria on it. Probably fecal E. coli from a cow. Something like that. And that's how, oh, sorry, we washed, we washed it in one minute of cold water. So it's had all the washing the supermarket had washed when it was ready to eat, and we washed it for an extra minute, and it's still got bacteria on. So we wash with Starstream, and it cleans it all off. So that works very well. well I'm, uh, and also, it increases the shelf life. If this is basil straight from the supermarket, and this is from the same bag washed in one spot here, it seems to live a bit longer. We wash the whole leaf and leave it. After seven days, it looks a lot fresher than that. So increase your shelf life, so that's good. Why am I interested in this? Well, people die from salad. Um, there's a few a year. I am dead certain there's going to be a lot more. Uh, 10 years from now, it'll be a lot more serious. Uh, and the reason is antimicrobial resistance. So it's often said that unless a solution is found, by 2050, antimicrobial resistance will cost the global economy more than the current size of the global economy and will be killing more people than cancer. Uh, this is often called the antibiotic apocalypse, but it's not just about antibiotics being ineffective against bact uh, bacteria. It's about antivirals becoming ineffective against viruses, antifungals against fungi, and drugs that treat against 
parasites like the ones that cause malaria becoming ineffective. Why are they becoming ineffective? It's natural selection. There's no, there's no avoiding it. Once you, if you give me an antibiotic, I will urinate that low dose of that antibiotic will go into the sewage system where all the other bacteria will receive it and some will be more resistant than others and the ones that aren't resistant will die and you'll be left with a population that is more resistant. So this is unavoidable, it's gonna happen. So I think the most important, it's shocking to talk about money, it's shocking to talk about cancer, but the most important word is unless. Because there's the optimistic viewpoint, and I think governments around the world have the optimistic viewpoint. They say, throw enough money at this. Researchers will find something, and they will be correctly identifying the problem rather than selling a solution. You know, you go to an academic and say, what would be used for this? And the academic won't just say, well, fund me, and I'll use whatever my expertise is. That'll fund it. They'll actually solve the problem. It's an optimistic thing, because honestly, academics tend to stay within their safe zone. So researchers will find something. Drug companies will translate it cost-effectively to 7 billion people in a manner, and their animals, in a manner that will allow ready take-up despite culture, infrastructure, training, behavior, religion, migration, war, black market, and the fact that you have racehorses worth $100 million, so people are gonna cheat. And despite the fact that you get parts of the world where you can buy really powerful last resort antibiotics over the counter, travel 50 miles into a rural area, and you have no healthcare other than rural healthcare. So we have a very strange world in which we think we're going to beat this by 2050. And then that someone will keep discovering new drugs and successfully rolling them out to 7 billion people faster than bugs become resistant to them. Uh, we haven't discovered a new class of antibiotic in over 40 years. And uh, this thing, 2050, is significantly less than 40 years away. So I like the pessimistic view. We must learn to live in a world without antibiotics. Because it'll come. There'll come a point where some government's going to say, actually, I know we'll lose votes, but voters in and we'll ban antibiotics for pets. And we'll double the price of food. Because that's, we're going to have to train the farmers. 70% of antibiotics used in the States go to animals, mainly for farming. So you're going to have to have a government with the guts to kill pets and double the price of food. All this will come. Someone said, the time may come when penicillin can be bought by anyone in the shops. Then there is the danger that the ignorant man may easily underdose himself and by exposing his microbes to non-lethal quantities of the drug, make them resistant. Does anyone know who said that? It was Fleming in his 1945 Nobel Prize acceptance speech when he got the Nobel Prize for discovering penicillin. He said we would get here. He said, we would have to live in a world without antibiotics. Prepare for it. And we haven't. This is the, uh, these are samples of E. coli that are resistant to antibiotics. 2009, the yellow shows quite serious. 2013, it's spreading. Because as soon as somebody, when somebody travels in an aircraft, you've got 100 people in a metal tube, with the hand washing facilities next to the food facilities, you have no idea of the health structure of anyone. And the first, time, first thing they do when they get off the airplane is get on the escalator. And they put their hands on that rubber strip. Bacteria will live on that rubber strip for one year and be viable. So when you put your hand on it, you've got a year's worth of other bacteria that will sit next to each other. And you put two bacteria next to each other, and it takes four hours for resistance to transfer. Four hours for a, an evolutionary step. If we got breeding, it would take 10,000 years to see any evolutionary step. Four hours. In some ways, the microbes are out evolving us. Um, and the government says we need new incentives to pay. We need give, to give financial incentives to the pharmaceutical industries. We put money aside in funds to give to drug companies. And then everybody gets, wow, 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 somebody's made a discovery. Will it solve the antibiotic resistance? No, it won't, because it's natural selection. Center for Disease Controls recommend that hands be washed for 20 seconds in warm, soapy water. In the UK, the average wash is six seconds. It's zero amongst the men, um, often in cold water. But here, we can wash with cold water, and we can get the microbes off. And crucially, we don't kill them. All we do is remove them and get them back into the sewage system. That's very powerful, because if you don't kill them, you don't change the population, the genetics. So you keep the susceptible ones back in the population, breeding with the resistant ones. Um, 
Okay, this is a wound. It's in a pig. This wound has got MRSA. And can you see that slime? It's a biofilm of MRSA. Look under the microscope, and there it is. Multi-resistant is what the MR stands for. So it's a very dangerous microbe. That's untreated. Now if we get to wa a nurse to wash this wound, to clean it out, that's what you see under the microscope. It doesn't remove it. And our inability to treat these wounds costs us a lot. In the end, for diabetics alone, just diabetics, it's a billion pounds a year, 6,000 amputations, because we can't clean foot wounds. So if we can clean wounds, we're talking about saving a lot. This is now a wash with Starstream, just cold water, removes the MRSA. So it's very good at cleaning wounds, and I do hope to be cleaning wounds from this. I shall leave you, unless there's questions, with this, which is, I think, it's the most remarkable result my team has ever produced. It's the most, I think, I think it's the most remarkable thing I've ever seen in science. Maybe I'm wrong. Here it is. This is, this is a wound uh, of some living human skin, which you, you can buy in a Petri dish. We didn't. And this thing on the outside here is the epidermis, the outer layer that protects you. It feels good. This is the granular layer. It's bad when it's exposed. It gets infected. And what we've shown is we can clean out wounds that have this. However, can we also make the wounds get better? Now, to make wounds get better, you don't just have to clean them clean of infection. You have to somehow tell these things, these dark spots, which are called fibroblasts. You have to tell them to get up to the top and start healing. Can you see? They're slowly healing there. This is seven days after the skin has been peeled back. Now, fibroblasts take a, a complicated set of codings to activate like this, because you don't want them forming skin anywhere over your body. And I was wondering, can we use the sound in the water stream, adapt star stream to produce a device called star healer that triggers those complicated set of codings that makes these things fire off and heal? So this is the sample. With, it's been kept clean, so we're not even beating out infection. There's no cleaning effect here. This is purely healing. We kept this sterile. There is no infection. You're not cleaning. You're trying to heal. Um, this is the same sort of sample. After a nurse, uh, this, this was left for seven days. This, the nurse washed it for, seven, for two minutes in saline, and then we left it seven days. And you, maybe you say, well, there, there's a slight improvement. Now we take a sample through Star Healer. So it's cold water with sound in it. And we wash for two minutes after the injury, and then we wait for seven days. This is what Star Trek would call your dermal regenerator. You can see that the healing process has uh, increased an order of magnitude. So wounds can be made to heal far more faster with this new device, Star Healer, which puts sound down a column of water. And of course, if you, can, uh, if, you can cut, if you can get healing, you get the epidermis growing, you reduce the effect, the likelihood of infection, and the rest. So by taking this device and washing wounds, we can A, clean out the uh, microbe that will cause infection, and B, we can tell the wound to heal maybe 10 times faster than it would normally. OK, I think is my time up at that? My time is up, so I shall leave you there. Um, I had a couple more slides that I will skip through so that I can just say, uh, put my acknowledgements up. There. Thank you very much.